A spade has many uses and consequently different names. However, despite the name, form or use it goes by, here on The Advocate, we call it by its name, a spade. Welcome to another No Holds Bad edition of your favorite program on Plus TV Africa, The Advocate. My advocacy today is on the multifaceted and dynamic issues surrounding migration. In what he calls a thought that could save lives, Omoni gives his opinion on waste disposal with a little bit of biology. Should you be monogamous with a chain or just own your own polygyny? Comfort breaks it down for us. Kunle is going to read out 10 commandments of being a political aspirant. And finally, Ejemai talks about better education. Sit back. The panelists are here to present your Sunday dose of provoking thoughts after this break. The many faces of migration. Every year, many Nigerian migrants and refugees make the difficult decision to leave their families behind and embark on dangerous and sometimes treacherous journeys through land and sea. And then the headlines and news captions read as, as follows. Greece drafts new legislation to speed up migrant de deportations. Over 80 migrants found hiding in trucks. About 73 irregular migrants arrested in Turkey. Over 90 irregular migrants rescued in Libya, and so on and so forth. The EU Commission seeks faster deportation of migrants. Irregular migration brought me nothing but despair, says an Eritrean migrant. And you find my, these headlines go on in different forms. Sometimes you see Nigerian migrant returns after risking everything for a better life. Or you see thousands of African migrants crying for help from different parts of Africa and having forced to return to their homes after failing. And again, sometimes you see things that are really like, even the animals are not even the conditions we live in now. From, from young children who have actually embarked on this journey and have dreamt of a happy life in Europe. But then, for a lot of them, their hopes for a better life has faded. I constantly felt like a guest with no hope, says A, a migrant who traveled irregularly. Not enough food, bathrooms, or healthcare services, says a Nigerian returnee from Libya who's warning other Nigerians against irregular migration. And in the words of another migrant, cautioning other Nigerians against embarking on irregular migration to Libya, you say, the cost of living is much higher than you can imagine. And thousands of Nigerian irregular migrants who travel through Libya each year with the aim of reaching Europe eventually just may never achieve that goal. It was the toughest journey one could ever have, says a Nigerian returning. Those who go regularly too don't necessarily have a bed of roses. You're a stranger in another's country, a hustle to get jobs that citizens may also want, the re-education to fit in, what of the culture shock, and an alienation from family and a support system. The many faces of migration. But what is migration in itself? Simply put, migration is movement from one place to the other. And it's as old as human beings. It is, an, it is not a new phenomenon, so why is global migration taking a front burner role today? Maybe because for a country like Nigeria, the push-pull factors are interesting. On one hand, we are dealing with a massive brain drain of competent citizens, yet on the other hand, we are also seeing an influx of other citizens coming to explore our country and harness its economic value. But the issues that surround migration are multifaceted and dynamic. And while I may have a right to migrate, the question becomes, what about the place I'm going to? What value am I bringing there? And is it enough to know that a country has a working system and I want to just get in there? Now, so many Nigerians in their quest for greener pastures have chosen to get to Europe by all means, and most have opted for the Libya Mediterranean route. For hearing stories of victory from yesteryears by the brothers or sisters who have successfully crossed over. However, what many don't hear are the stories of missing relatives or the odious torture stories on the journey. Issues such as a lack of good job opportunities within the country has pushed a lot of people to seek work abroad and the same sense of despondency is discouraging migrants from considering the return to their home countries. In pursuing better jobs and economic opportunities, migrants often end up in situations of trafficking, modern day slavery and irregular migrant status. 
Vulnerabilities begin at the earliest stages of migration planning and recruitment in origin countries, including deception and exorbitant fee charging. Are many people aware that people from certain countries can't get asylum status readily due to their country of origin? An example would be Nigeria. And not many Nigerians do realize that Nigeria is not classified as a country that would grant you the ability to get asylum status. Would we as a people actually leave our country if the infrastructure was good? If quality of life is assured and electricity can be had, what of jobs or an enabling environment for business and income generation? There may be a glimmer of hope in the myriad of interventions now coming up though through international agencies in collaboration with the federal government. But how soon, how well, and what will really, when will this happen? The question though is, is this enough for a teeming population? What more can be done or are we all going to run away? To go is hard, to stay is difficult. Which way Nigeria? But as I often say, we move because we must keep hope alive. If you must migrate, adopt safe migration options. Oh. So, mm. uh, my, my view is this. Migration, whether legal or illegal, is expensive. Mm. And I feel at times that some of the people that have attempted to leave this country could have done better with the resources they pulled together to leave than going through that very uh, difficult experience. And I know that especially those that um, go through Libya, at the end of the day, it's all, all bad tales for them. And one other thing that I've also found over time is that um, the stories you hear will only be stories of successes. People will not tell you what they went through, how bad and difficult it was. And I think that also encourages people to want to reach out without doing enough research. I'm thinking, you know, that it's time to leave Nigeria. Let me migrate. Let me leave too, you know. I'd really? Never, I'd really? Never, really? I'd never thought about it. I'd never. I'd always, you know, been one person that believed no matter how bad it is, we're going to remain, you know, in, in, in this country. That had been me. But when I now started thinking of what it would take, this is to legally migrate. Oh, mm. I don't have energy to start entering boats or crossing the Sahara <laughs> and all that. And I realized, you know, you have to do this, you have to do that, write an exam to speak English. Oh, that I, they say I have to write an exam, you know, all that. I say, you know what, if I live, well, now that I'm a queen in my country, and hmm. I go now, I don't even know what I'm going to go and do there. Is it to wash toilet yeah. or whatever? I said, mm -mm, let me just stay here. So this is even me talking from the perspective of somebody who thought of legal migration and see all the wahala. Mm -hmm. Then you decide you want to ride the camel's back, go through the sandstorms, with enter the boot of a car, be cramped. And as you know, he said, the monies that have to go into it, if you had deployed it here, you probably would have started a small industry. There was the story of that woman. She, she became famous because I think she had been rescued or so. She, had, she, was, a, she was in Calabar. She had um, a small business. And she used the fact that she had a small business to go and borrow either 400 or 600 K to embark on a trip to Libya to go to Europe. Nobody sent, nobody told her now she had to come back. So she now came back after going through that horror and still was telling us on the news that she now still had the, the bill, the loan that oh, she had borrowed yeah, to, yeah, to pay that. Back. She still had to liquidate that. Yes, she still had to liquidate that. I don't want to, to sound callous. We, we should be realistic. But honestly... Illegal migration is not the way. I honestly don't feel sorry for them. I'm sorry. Um, if we come back to our country, yes, it's hard, it's difficult and all that. But you know what? It's still our country. And for some funny reason, Nigeria just has this tick about it that all you need is either the right moment, the right place, the right person, the right idea. And for what it is worth, you can actually create something despite all our issues. I mean, I had to come to that realization despite all our issues. So um, my own advocacy on your behalf is <laughs> say no to illegal migration. Say no to illegal <laughs> migration. So, 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 so for me, it's, it's been maybe because I work in the governance sector and I just look at it like, okay, it's hard to legally migrate. I'm not a nomad, though I'm slim. 
So I'm not going to go through those horrors. No, thank you. And then I just looked at it. I'm in governor's space. Ah, in two or three years, my friends will become governors. And in 10 years, my friends will be the president. <laughs> ah, it's now you want me to jack Are you okay? <laughs> I didn't go since. It's now you want me to leave. No, because it's about to get better. Not like I'm, I'm corrupt or anything. Ah, yeah, well. You know what we mean. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. So um, looking at it, you ask yourself the real questions. Like she, she uh, confirmed mentioned. For you to even go abroad, you're asked to write an exam in English. I'm about 40, write exam again. For what now? I've written enough, for me, I feel I've written enough exams in my lifetime. I don't want to write one more, not one more. And the fact I speak English, and I have to write to, sp uh, to speak English in another country, that already tells me how the country will look at me when I start working in that country. It just eventually looks like that for me. So I already feel they don't want us here. They don't want us. It's better to sit down here and just work for our country generally. Mm. Well, I don't have so much to say on legal migration. I have absolutely no idea about that. But like Comfort um, said, prior to now, I was mm. totally comfortable with Nigeria. Yeah. I travel almost every summer with my family. Um, I've progressed in the workplace. There's really no need to leave Nigeria. But unfortunately, I'm now on that train of migration. I'm actually even closer to it than you would ever imagine. Oh, wow. And why? My husband came to me last year about this time and he brought up the subject and I was like, are you kidding? <laughs> I'm almost management I'm management position in public sector. I'm a director in my private in my teaching institution center. I own my own business. I'm doing bloody well. Why would mm. I want to do mm. that kind of thing? And he made a very solid point that I cannot but agree with him. Mm. We have a special son. Mm. And Nigeria has nothing to offer this mm. boy. Oh, and so okay. yes, the migration suddenly at Did almost 40, team. came to my table and I had to write that exam and I aced that exam. And so now I am on that path. And I, right now, this week, I've been going from places to places saying my goodbyes mm. and but telling them that I'm not going on a permanent basis. I'm oh, available wow. to serve. Remember me, just give me a call. I'm just around the turn. I have to do this for my children. Now, you see, now that brings me to the final part of what I was talking about in my advocacy, that what is the solution? We need to find how we're going to get the infrastructure and the system to work. Because half of us, in the, um, all of us in this room talking right now, do not fall into the category of the teeming population who see it as big. But then anyway... We will probably have to continue the conversation on migration over and over and keep thinking of solutions and ways forward. But then, our money is next after this break. Just a thought could save the day. I watched as three young Nigerians walk down a clean and well-paved road in Lekki Phase 1. This is highbrow Lagos. And he dropped a cup of corn with a black cellophane bag, nylon bag. It was one of three, but it could have been any one of them. I looked down as they trudged down the road. I was torn between picking up the trash and running up to him with it. I visualized stuffing it in the bag that nest, nestled on the arm of one of his compatriots. I had picked trash and returned it back to sender a few times in the past. I had got out of a car in traffic to do the honor of picking a bottle thrown out of a new Honda Accord. I ahead of the car I was in and we waited for the traffic lights to go green. I landed the well-dressed but bewildered offender the plastic bottle. He meekly accepted it. However, the passage of time has helped me to realize that there is a bigger problem emanating from our lack of awareness and thoughtlessness. It is frightening how many of us in Lagos have failed to develop a sense of environmental or self-awareness. Some of our acts might not be bad intentioned, but the sum of their repercussions have continued to make our way of still life a harrowing experience. 
the issue of waste disposal is just a touching point of several thoughtless acts that have become involuntary actions like breathing. Mm -hmm. A little biology, when an action is produced with the involvement of thoughts, they are called voluntary actions. It involves actions like walking, eating, jumping, and running. These actions are produced consciously. Both the spinal cord and the brain are involved, and these coordinate with the peripheral nervous system to generate necessary movements. Thoughtlessness is an issue when we do the wrong things automatically. Let's examine the effect of dropping trash on roads. The trash on road a lot of times go into drainages. It trains and the gutters are unable to evacuate water rapidly enough because they are clogged. Mm. The overflow floods the road. Mm. Flooded road cause traffic. Mm. And some unfortunate motorists might get water in the wrong compartment of his or her vehicle. He or she would need to pay for some expensive repairs. Over time, the roads also get damaged. More public funds will have to be allocated for road maintenance. Or the road is abandoned to its fate. It becomes an eyesore and a wreck of a vehicle's suspension. A bad road is also a harbinger of traffic jams and traffic robberies. Heavier rains could result in flooding. We have seen pictures of, our, of apartments with floating beds. These also result in huge financial losses to individuals or even loss of lives. It is interesting to note that proper waste disposal could drastically reduce the effect of this hail wind. Many people do not understand cause and effect. Too many of us appear to be on autopilot and do things without giving a thought to its repercussion on the environment or others. We need to deliberately start to change this for the future. We need to start teaching the children responsibility, actions and reactions. We need to teach awareness, both self and environmental awareness. How does shunting in traffic affect others? What of jumping queues and energy thefts? Not paying for services rendered. We need to train the coming generation to see beyond an individual picture so that actions that take into cognizance communal good will become our new normal. Man, do you know as you were talking, all I could think was, my goodness, well, how a little, one little action, the ripple effect of it, because, you know, at first when I thought waste disposal, I was like, okay, yes, I know it's a bad thing. But the more you painted that grim picture, the scared, the scared, the more scared I, even I became that, you know, the bad roads, the final challenge of the society we're living in from just one thoughtless action that we carry out. Like when I was growing up, I remember that my mom would insist, you dare not throw something out of the window or throw litter or you're going even at this house, you see litter on the floor, you must pick it up. And then the question then becomes, is anybody actually telling anyone, don't do this? Many years ago in Lagos, I used to see these big, big billboards around that, that, that long road that is the seven up where they talk about, you know what, litter, there was a litter campaign and advocacy then, of course, Kai. But I guess, um, sadly, you've triggered something in me. I hope it does trigger something in other people and we see some difference with this, but it was quite startling for me to realize that what thoughtlessness can actually do in the big picture. Uh, well, money, what, okay. what, what I find really amusing in this situation is, is it that they don't know when oh, you like school, or like <laughs> you teach them in school that you should not litter. No, I mean, because I, I can't fathom it. And what actually drives me crazy, we've discussed this on The Advocate before, and what drives me crazy the most is when you see Loma officials, these ladies in orange suits, mm. or the roads, in Lagos roads in particular, sweeping the roads, and now sweeping the sand into, into the, the gutter. gutter. I mean, when they're not trained before they got that job, they're compounding the problem. And truly, we all cannot even do enough. And you know the funniest thing? Waste business is so lucrative. Hmm. If you can key into yeah, it. Yeah, waste of wealth. Mm -hmm. You know how much we can make if every household is made to pay the minimum amount for waste disposal? How much it could generate, the government could generate? Oh, it's a lot it. of money that we're not actually exposed.
Well, I'm going to go to that part. <laughs> Don't go there, please. <laughs> but that one, no, but, but then Marriage I is the waste yeah. and, you know, make money. You can't go without each other. Because truly, the last time we were discussing this point, Comfort was like, what am I going to do with my waste if the government doesn't come and pick it? What do I do? Yeah, but I'm just like tired. I'm tired of honestly discussing these issues that, you know, were things that... Time, it's not as if we were not managing these things before. Mm -hmm. it, 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 that's, that's it. You made a very good point. Number one, sorry, Omoni, I love the way you, as you said, you, you broke it down, the ripple effect of it. It was really well um, um, written. And when um, Anitom mentioned about um, our parents, mm -hmm. I can still hear her. Come on, will you pick that thing? Yeah. Did you throw it out of the window? Is everything all right with you? I can still remember exactly. it. And I, I mean, it's the same thing that I do. And when did we lose that? Then what mm. happened to um sanitation days i know that there was an issue of oh it's not um, um, a yeah, law it wasn't one, yes it was in fridge of, of yes <laughs> okay movement. so we now yes exactly so we now made it a legal thing so what happened to the legislation and say okay this was something that was making some headway it was working because we, we actually became tuned to it at that time you know, that yes way. yes i mean in hmm. certain parts so why didn't somebody take it up the legislature say okay let us make this into a law so that it you, on this day yes we've agreed we're going to infringe on our right to, to move here because we want to clean our country because that's what it should be now we have did you see that devastating picture of the cab inside the yeah. the, yeah. the, yeah. the plastics yeah. and yeah. all that we don't have the infrastructure mm. to take care of the waste we point. have an overbloated population mm -hmm. that is mm -hmm. churning out waste on a on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Then we have an uncivilized um, population That's that is does that does not think anything of as you say you be in a car. If I see somebody that I don't think okay probably doesn't know, but I expect the person who is driving a car who has who has just picked children from the school, mm. is, uh, you in fact you see the mother helping the child wind down the window <laughs> to toss it out of the window. I mean oh, when was, how mm. where did we how did we get there? You know for me comfort. One year I thought your advocacy was brilliant, but um, I believe in Nigeria it's not thoughtlessness. It's thoughtful man. I'll explain why. Mm. I was on a flight coming back from outside the country. And there was this woman who carried her, her trash. I remember she was having chocolates. I don't know why she was having, eating lots of chocolates, but she dropped them in the trash in the airport way. The moment she lands Lagos, hmm. she, she, let me tell you, she's throwing the trash in the plane. Whoa. The same person. Like really? Yeah. So I don't believe it's a thoughtlessness. I believe we have trained ourselves to understand that in Nigeria, we are all above the law. That no, is the problem. Caution. And Comfort was mentioning legislation. It's people that know the constitution that can change the laws. <laughs> I didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But it's not legislation. I do not think that truly that you can actually legislate behavior. I mean, I've been on the paradigm shift campaign and those are things like the communication for development. Some things that have to do with mindset and that's why I was keen into the fact that the thoughtlessness of it. See, while you may say it wasn't thoughtlessness, the reality is that when you are in different environments, there are parts of your brain that just switch mode. I'm telling you. But I think I'm only... It's about to say something. Okay. Let's have a thoughtful conversation just after this. Up next is comfort. Stay tuned. To be monogamous with a chain or polygynous with full chest. Another drama at the grave site, a mourning wife, her defensive children, a known or unknown other woman, children that bear a photocopy-like resemblance to the man laid to rest, factions in the extended family, tension, uncertainty. I could go on painting the scenario, but at one time or the other, we have all heard stories like this that touch. Bringing us to my advocacy, isn't it time to be practical? Marriage has been defined as a union of a man and a woman for companion and procreation. However, today the definition has changed globally with different viewpoints, an institution, a partnership, and as a responsibility. Marriage is going through a lot of bashing with the main bone of contention being whether a man can be monogamous. Is he polygynous by nature but made monogamous by man? Which is a more natural state. With the prevailing rate of men in monogamous marriages, with at least one other woman in his life. This advocacy is not talking about philandering men, but men who deliberately keep a second or even a third woman in a similar state of matrimony without the document and have children with these women. And on the day he dies, all hell breaks loose. 
The family is the bedrock of any society, and currently it is facing so many challenges that cannot be all addressed in this advocacy. On this side of the divide, we need to make up our minds what we accept as marriage. We have three types of unions in Nigeria, civil unions, Islamic and traditional marriages. Civil union is based on the adopted legal framework of the British of one woman, one man, which the church subscribes to as standard, while the country retains traditional marriages, which is our culture. In most cases, you have the man marrying both or more women using different methods secretly. Without a clear understanding of what we want to recognize and practice, we're going to keep having unfortunate situations, fractured families, inheritance fights and battles, and unnecessary bad blood. A couple of men have stayed true to who they are and have been clear that they are polygynous and have lived their lives and conducted their affairs, so thereby mitigating drama. The surprises have come when the man has conformed to societal norms. Not a problem, but men who find themselves in this dilemma need to make arrangements while still alive to mitigate the pain and potential damage that could occur after their demise, if not for the women involved, for the sake of the children. Women have an innate need to be recognized along with her children. But as long as the prevailing practice is to bury our heads in the sand on this one, there will always be rancor unless the man settles, provides for her while he's still alive, or reduces his wishes into a will. But then he better have a strong lawyer, lawyer willing to do his bidding, even in death. Either way, the evil that men do lives Leaves after, after death. Hmm. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this table is a shattering table. I, a I mean, I think I was about 24, and I'm not going to mention his name. Hmm. He was the last born of his family. He was completely pampered, he was loved, and all that. His father died. And lo and behold, on that day, he realized that suddenly, mm -hmm. and not the last one again, mm -hmm. My goodness. he was frightened, mm -hmm. he was oh. shocked, he was upset, mm -hmm. everything yeah. came upon him. Mm -hmm. And he kept saying, oh, so I'm not the last one. <laughs> oh, so, the last one. <laughs> so while everybody was devastated and scrambling and trying to figure out how, when, where, my friend was just shouting, I'm like, I'm no longer the last one. <laughs> yeah, you're no longer the last one. So I think I think the major issue there is the dishonesty of it. Mm -hmm. That well, is true. what ripples through everybody's veins. And, but, but, but the second yeah. wife knows about it, or the third wife, as the case might be. But I think it's the first wife yeah. that is oblivious mm. of everything. Mm. Who somewhere in her <sighs> mind has revived her husband and felt like, oh, he was a good man, he loved me, provided for me. Then upon his death, you realize that, oh, he actually wasn't as but good he, as But like he, he was a good man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I think there's, there's always been a problem, and, and that's the problem of culture. Mm. Okay. Okay. The, the, the society forces things down our throats. Very true. And um, we don't... Well, the word, the word is, we don't own those things. We don't decide to be, be me. Mm -hmm. So if Agree. Mm -hmm. polygamy is the way for me, mm -hmm. why don't I just Which come out oh, and be polygamous? Um, I'm thinking, what would people say? What would this person say? And that is shaping the things I do. So, so we, we need to have a case where more people are doing things with, with a conviction. So, many people are going to monogamous marriages or even getting married at all mm. without a conviction. Mm. But yeah, it's, it's the next thing. You are, you are you're a man, you are going close to 30, you have a job, you have this. Next thing is to get married. You know, I, interesting that we're having this kind of conversation today because in the last few weeks, or should I say months, recently, I've, I've said questioning the fact that where did the narrative of monogamy come God from? God bless you. That's my... You know, that question had said coming. And I said, I said asking, okay. I mean, most of my adult life, I had pretty much stayed on or the idea or the knowledge of being monogamous, like Omolani or like Omoni said that, because of what society had said. Now, please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I want to be polygamous. But then I asked myself something, really and truly, what exactly is the problem with it? Hmm. What is the issue with it? Because there are situations where I found it very saddening that for a study for men who are married to their first wives and then for whatever reasons, not because they want to be philandering, 
eventually do meet somebody or someone and then they actually have a better relationship with the next second or third wife. Now, a lot of women, I've had women who literally want to, like, you know, stone me. And I'm saying that, really, it might be time for us to look at what exactly is it that we want to be. What does culture say? And even for religion, especially the Christian religion, I told some people that the British method or the, or the one we have adopted, what has the, the, the book that we follow, what has it really said about it? I said, and the part about reference to one man, one woman clearly stated was about if you're holding a position within the institution of a church. But in the in prior times for then, we've seen men who had numerous wives, a lot of other people outside of what we call today concubines. And I'm like, this story is a, this narrative is a very dicey narrative. But, really, I, think, but, but I, I do not think something. I have a problem with In people. comfort advocacy, comfort, you said uh, when he decides. I think now and here in the 21st century, we should, we should remove the fact that it can be a he. In this situation, truly, I think it's both genders. Okay, because now that's because that's a dimension. That's a dimension. So you need a woman having more than one husband. Of course. But you know, it's like that dicey. And that part is the part that I can't think about. Husband, situationship. Okay, so for me, my, my advocacy was coming from what we already have. We haven't even finished dealing with the tradition. <laughs> I want to shake which the is table. A man, a man, and I love the way any so you distilled what the advocacy is really about, and that is please let's be practical. Men and for me are not built to be monogamous. We women have more of that because once she settles with a man and all, you know, she's she guides she her, she secures her position, her children, brings everybody up, you know, keeps the whatever. The man is meant to pro, pro, what do you call it, propagate his um, his uh, lineage. I think that would, if we're more honest, and I don't think it's culture that is our problem, our culture wants to marry more women, mm -hmm. our men want to marry more women, it's the adoption of strange laws that we have come and put and twisted religion uh, you, into it you, for me that is causing the problem. Your culture is a way of life and um, whether you like it or not, what is our culture now mm -hmm. is not, is not necessarily our original culture. Mm -hmm. There are okay. so many things that we okay. do as Nigerians okay. that there are just too many. Um, look at even the way we marry. You, one person will want to go to church, court. have traditional wedding, go to court. That's true. Yes. It, it's... It's they all coming think. from what has become mm. our new culture. I don't know why Kule is quiet. Uh, Kule, yeah, why are you quiet? <laughs> what are your thoughts on this? Yes. Yes. Oh, Kule, please rock it. We would like to hear Quick, your thoughts. So that we go on to you. No, no. Um, for me, you know, whenever I look at the situation of marriage and, you know, people's perspectives, <laughs> um, I would like to say I can be Solomon on one side. I, I don't mean, I'm not in reference to myself. Mm. I, mean, I mean men can be Solomon on mm -hmm. one side. And, of course, there are men that would just want to stay with one woman mm. and not want anything mm -hmm. else. And, like we've mentioned, the importation of culture. Funny, um, the people that brought us to culture, you know, when they were being taught religion by the original people that had it, and then they went to do crusades back to collect the Holy Land mm -hmm. from, those people don't have monogamous situations. Sure. Mm. So, it's somewhere along the crusades, the mentality of adoption of a culture mm. but forcefully put by Europe, so. like we wonder why so, one church yeah. is in Rome. Hmm. So, Kunle, nice one. I think you've ended it very well. So now on to politics with Kunle as he's giving us the Ten Commandments of what a political aspirant should live by. Don't go anywhere. The Ten Aspirant Commandments. There's a lot of force. When elections get close, we hear, start to hear funny things. Like, uh, I think in 2019, vote of change or change the change and funny other things that go on. 2023 isn't any different. And the issue that causes tears in the tissue are people want to run, be it not too young or just too cool to be in the Jurassic Park of political dinosaurs, that they ignore the work in the race, which is actually politics. The greatest error is that, that they forget to actually walk the path. And that's kind of common, that's kind of common. and it's like getting hit by a packed car. Mm. For me, these are the 10 aspiring commandments in politics for people that want to delve into politics. The first one would be, politics could turn anyone into an animal. Try not to get caught up. The truth is, from experience, 
people always talk. They have something to say always. As long as you're a politician, you have a target on your back. Uh, but you always have to carry this, and this is what I carried while running for office, is that lions do not bother about the opinion of sheep. And that's the best way to keep it. Two, never let your next move be predicted. The moment you can be predicted, the electorate and even people you're running against can plot anything from anything. And trust us, we have no limits when it comes to political destruction. Three, don't trust anyone. Those who hail you the most are the Judas of the park. For campaigns, keep this in mind. There are always 11 Judas and one Peter. <laughs> and making sure that one Peter is you as the candidate that's running. So best you be denied that privilege to anybody else or annihilated in the game of politics. Four, never get high on the we are behind you. The houses who say, say kai, the Yorubas who of course, baba, or mommy, let's not make it, let's be conscious of the female gender too running for office. I'll tell you, it doesn't translate into votes. Forget all the Facebook likes, you can even have 7 million followers on Facebook. You'll be shocked the number of votes you pull together won't be up to 1,000. Five, keep your eye on the ball always. Aspirations come with distractions. I can tell you why running for office. As a man or a woman, you'll be sought out by a lot of people, the kind of people you thought would never be able to talk to you. Once it starts to get in, once it gets in your head, let me remind you, after ballot day, your phone that used to ring about 1,000 missed calls in a day. Trust me, you'll be looking for who to call you. Six, keep your family and politics completely separated. Now, this is a very key thing, and most people mix it up, which is why most times wives and children who were never part of the aspiration, or husbands and children who were never part of the aspiration, get caught up. Seven, politics is local. One key attribute I learned while running for office was being able to switch from Barack Obama to Adedibu as the need arises. Eight, welcome to the jungle. It will be full of smear campaigns, so train yourself to face a blog report from your husband's side chick. That's if you are a woman. And most hurting of all, you'll be mocked by those closest to you. You know what it is to, to be, sit on your school group and be told, so now, because you made a common statement, maybe during a conversation, jokingly, you now think you're better than us because you're running for Senate. Who the hell are you? You weren't even the smartest of one of us. Nine, in Nigeria, which is the corruption capital, you have to, as a, you have to, as a new aspirant, be prepared. If you don't have a backyard of dollars, then prepare to be David with a catapult against 21 Goliaths. And that is the reality. Ten, Believe in the best possibilities and prepare for the worst. The ballot day is nothing but a day. Things will go back to the same, whether you win or you don't. These are inspired by things I felt and anticipated while running for the highest legislative office in Nigeria in 2019. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> if I may have... So where is the green light? Okay, if I may have the first reaction. Um, you said something about praise singing, and even in, in our everyday life, people that use a lot of sars, sars for me, or they call me boss, are people that I'm just naturally very weary of. I'm always afraid, because it can easily get into your head. Yeah. But these are people that also at the same time, when, they are, when you are not there, they are probably calling you different names. And you know, the Yorubas are very respect conscious. But someone that respects you or uses a respectful word like eh, which is a way of showing okay. respect, you know, it would use that respectful phrase, but it might also be abusing you at the same time. So I'm always very wary and very careful about people that tend to just sing your praise. Uh, if it gets into your head, I'm telling you, you'll be very disappointed. You know, what, what I, what I, interesting that, I mean, and the Yoruba part, thank you for referencing how we can be like that. But what got to me, what really hit me from your advocacy was the fact that in a, like, light bulb moment, it hit me that, 
politics may not be understood by a lot of people. The idea of politics in itself is like a behavior pattern, like who you are. There was so, you said Barack Obama to Adedibu, and I can assure you that that was like a light bulb moment. It, politics is actually an issue of personality. How you can move around, how you can be true to this one, be that to that person. But you know, we, a lot of people in Nigeria especially, look at politics as an ideology. You coming to come and push an agenda. But politics is actually taking on a person to achieve a goal. And as you went through the Ten Commandments of political aspirants, I'm like, for the first time ever, you hit me that you know what I'm doing. Maybe this is why a lot of people are unable to get into politics or a lot of people that do try on the basis of ideology don't get it because politics is you meandering and pushing something. It was just behavior. It hits me. But somehow I feel running to the Ten Commandments, maybe it's my personality, where is the cup that is half full? That's what I'm, that's what I'm wondering. Reading, to, reading the Ten Commandments you've put out, Kunle, I have this um, flashback as if you've had it, you've had it really bad. No, yeah. I, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I, I've not walked in your shoes, so mm -hmm. I cannot say for sure. Mm -hmm. But reading through it, I'm like, if I'm supposed to come into this journey, mm -hmm. I'm asking myself, where is the cup that is half full? But, but I think you know, where is the light? See what the that reality says, is. Exactly. Yes. That's, you want that's his own. That. That is what that he's coming it. from. His own experience. He's bringing his experience to the table. But it was relatable. But, mm -hmm. I know it might be, but I'm asking. I'm saying, if I'm a new person yeah. trying to start on this journey, mm. what is in it? From what the Ten Commandments you've, you've told me, the, 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 the do's and the don'ts. What then makes me see the do? Okay, there's a there's a book. <laughs> Love does not win elections. Yes, I, I shall. shall. So, I shall. Sorry, that's a good book. That was an amazing book. If, 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 yeah. if you've read the book, yeah, uh -huh. you will see that there are, there are lots of um, parallel with the Ooh. things Kunle has yeah. Mm -hmm. shared. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what Kunle is just trying to do is, if you're going to politics, Gary. these are possible pitfalls. These are mm -hmm. possible. I would have appreciated a balance of the ten. See, that's it. Of the 10 points he has given, mm -hmm. they might be true, like I said. It's from his own position. Yes. I would have appreciated a situation whereby he balances it out. Boy. Because it truly, it cannot be all so, bad. So the balance, is that, the balance is that you are an aspirant. Simple for That's me. It. That was what I took from it. Yeah. That Look, I've decided to run, um, to throw my, my heart in the ring and run this thing because I want to serve my people. Mm -hmm. For me, that's already the half, the half cup full. The next thing now is that these are the things to watch out for. You can you make it. it if you're able to to um, scale this one, then you will reach the promised land. Yeah, I love your own about the Judas. That's the one that I loved because I noticed it, your reaction. Yes, like, mm -hmm. yes, that Be got me. yes, that got because. Me. because it's not just in politics. If you can keep this in mind for mm. your life for throughout, life. that look, you, there are more people who are against you in your life than there are those for you. You would have um, fewer disappointments yeah. and fewer troubles. I because you, don't get no, yes. for me, I know, no, 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 I, I won't align with that point at all, at all. Like I said, maybe it's just my personality. No, okay. I, of course, it's possible that <laughs> I, would, I don't think I'm not, I'm not that kind of person that would go ahead with those kind of ten commandments. I think for me, my first commandment would be like. You want to do it? Go for it. You can achieve it. Then I can now begin to, no, number two obstacle, number three obstacle, number four, another strong point to get you kicking and get you going. But of course, over to you, Kunle. Okay. Listening to what you were saying, Ejimai, I think I'd like to just note that the commandments aren't to really scare anybody. But I think people rather be armed for war, mm -hmm. knowing exactly what the war is about, mm -hmm. preceding that. So now we're going to go to the importance of good education, which cannot be overemphasized, and then Jumai, of course, speaks on that after this break. The classroom is no longer a one-size-fits-all. I saw a result that was issued to a special child from the school that he attends. In the result, the boy was issued an F for all the 10 subjects he offered. And the teacher commented that the child needed to work harder. I asked myself, how else is this child to work harder? By the way, there are no dull learners, only dull teachers. If you have taught a child and he scores F all round, this is a sign that you, the teacher, have failed in your responsibility 
and nothing, absolutely nothing has been taught. This is 2021 and teachers need to upskill their teaching methods and techniques. If the kids do not learn the way you teach, it is your responsibility to figure out how to teach the child. Also, understand and educate yourself on teaching special needs children. I realized that the teacher and the school are oblivious of special needs and the best way to teach them. It is also emotionally draining and discouraging to send such a callous result to the parents. We need teachers to be trained on special needs education and how to navigate teaching children with special needs. We also need to be empathic as individuals. If the teacher was empathic, he or she would have known that such a result should never be sent to anybody chocolates of a parent. We have even seen now more than ever that academic success does not equal life success. So we must ensure that we do not write off learners in the classroom. The classroom should no longer be a one size fits all. You know, um, <laughs> when I when I when I when I listened to your advocacy, I was I was blown away because I think this is a topic that we've ignored a lot. It's only in Nigeria where special needs kids are not good in arithmetic. Across the world, they top the charts. NASA, they are super smart. Yes, but they can't be taught the way we teach um, other kids. So it begs the question. If they are so super smart, because they are usually geniuses across, as seen, with, they are very good with math, some are very good with pictorial representation, they are massively intelligent. So it just means that our educational system cannot handle geniuses. That's all. That's what I translated from. Uh, but, but to also be very honest, mm -hmm. you, you find that a lot of the no need students uh, go to school here in Nigeria and they do badly or they just manage. Maybe even come with a third class and then they go and do a master's abroad and they are the by far class. the best. True. Okay. So it, it um, I, I, I think that the way we'll teach or we expect people to learn might not really be the best for critical thinking. So you, you are thought to take it as is given. Okay, so let me tell you one, one of the things that I experienced in, in the university. If your lecturer teaches you something in a certain way, and then you find another way of explaining it, mm. you might be penalized for not even putting it down word for word. So that also shows that generally we might have an a problem with how we expect people to learn in Nigeria. What I think what it shows clearly is that um, Nigeria spends less than 10% of its budget on education. That's well, what I heard it that Buhari is going to move it to 50% in the coming years. 50? Yes, I heard. 15, I wrong. not 50. Oh, one five. Uh, how can it be 50 now? <laughs> what I thought it was going to be a new Nigeria. No, no, no. no I, I, I think that sadly um, this issue, this <laughs> issue that has been raised here is something that is deep, is painful. And it now also for me says that as people, especially in the education space, there's that drive, that need for education to become different. The skills of the future are so different from what Nigeria is even understanding or identifying. And obviously we're still using outdated teaching methods to be able to teach children in this, in this time and age. 2021. And, of, and then of course, now with all the myriad of issues raised here, is it any wonder that people are trying to jump out of Nigeria? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's at best, it was very relevant. But then, really, it's sad, it's unfortunate. And for special needs children, I've always had a heart for it. And I've been like, okay. But I think because I've been involved in a lot of things around education and development, I believe that there is a gradual mm. but slow change occurring in the education sector. Yes, maybe from the private system, private school system, but somewhat, somehow, special needs children 
are becoming relevant. I know quite a number, a few right now that parents are identifying and they don't also forget that the issue of stigmatization from society and also an inadequacy in terms of teaching teachers themselves but teachers this is let's give them some credit i believe I, it's a painful it was experience. instead i give the child it, it's a painful experience and sent it to the parents yes, in it, the house. a painful experience but i know because i have been in that space and i do have people in that space that a lot of teachers nowadays are personally upscaling now can personally. it be done better can the school system can we as society begin to hold the education system through every form we know accountable say you know what we want a difference can we begin to put push ourselves together say let's but you can so only I, want to, I want to take off from where you mm. you you um started um so what i got from the advocacy is that it's two-pronged there's the issue of special needs and then there's the issue of even just the general education itself mm -hmm. when kaduna state governor decided to be brave and take a step in that direction and say okay let me even and find out the people who are inside um, yes inside this place that is teaching the next generation mm. and all people were interested in is how to collect their money. It wasn't an issue of, it's even true. Let's go through the system. Let's go through the exam. Let's go through the fire and see who will come out uh, come out of it. So your education system already is in a huge, it's, it's a, there's a huge problem there. There isn't enough money to even, um, what do you call it, to to standardize it. Mm. Then you've left the, the space to entrepreneurial people, That's not it. educationists. Mm. When I was growing up, I, I was taught by teachers, people who loved, who had the passion, who understood, and that's what is also missing. And so, when you now spoke about um, not sending F9 to the, um, to the parents, that it is not fair. If the child has made F9, it's F9. You, you, you let the parent know. I am not one of those people that thinks that there, there's a standard. There are, there's a minimum standard that a child needs to, needs to be educated on because he or she is going to go out into the world. If you don't know how to add, if you don't understand how to speak basic, you put your tenses properly and all, that needs to be done. But as she said also, the issue of feeling sorry for the teachers, our teachers here are honestly battered. They're like the, yeah, like they're, they're yeah, honestly yeah. battered. They are not, um, they're, what do you call it, motivated enough. They are not being carried along. Um, and the parents, again, everything is the teacher. If, yes. the, if the child is not behaving properly, it's the teacher. If the child is not, it's the teacher. Where, where, where is the role of the parent in ensuring that, you know, we're not at home to even help them with mm -hmm. their homework. We're not at home to even understand, okay, what did you do in school? Where mm -hmm. can I help? Can I go and meet your teacher? We've left everything. We've, we've mm -hmm. outsourced it to a system that is already in problem. Yeah, and if you have mm. special needs children, should you as a parent actually put your special needs child in, in a mainstream school. school without actually putting, making sure yeah. that that mainstream school has the capacity, capacity to take in special needs children? Exactly. And if they don't, what can I as that kind of parent actually do Thank to that you. system? So, you know, it's it's a myriad of issues. Or should we actually move, scrap formal education you know, and I, really look at I, it and say, is this system working for us? You know, but I, I, we've, I've seen some developments in the sector. I have a friend in Abuja who has a special needs child. Um, she's about 13 now. Mm -hmm. But um, I, their system, what they did was, he and his wife started a school. His wife went and started reading online about special needs education. And they started a school. And right now, they're foremost in special needs education. In you Africa. see, that's it. I know people who've done that. And so, but so that is one person. But with the kind of, it, it's like sometimes these issues raise opportunities, doors that we're not looking at. Mm. They begin to, and what I believe strongly in the last one year, people in the education space, outside of government, you know, government and people should understand that technology and the change in dynamics have created avenues to change things. So if we actually have the opportunity to, in that space, as this advocacy is going on and as educationists are listening or watching, there's a lot of change that can be created because half of the children today are homeschooling anyway. Yeah. So can we actually take advantage of what we're having on ground and change the narrative? But then again, if a school, that particular school, that parent is not enough to just be angry, there should be issues taken up with that school. Now, why do we have a regular teacher taking this ch child mm -hmm. and giving no regular... You can't grade the child on what the child doesn't know. So definitely, we've all agreed that the parent, the teacher, the society, the government and private institution, all of us have to come together to make education for special needs better in Nigeria. We bring these issues to your plate because we all want a better society and a better Nigeria. So we will always want to see some of your opinions on issues we discuss here. 
Emu Owobete says APC and PDP members are already wired a certain way. The honest youths have to infiltrate both parties and diplomatically alter their mindsets. Unfortunately, is it through these parties that we should stand a chance to improve that we stand a chance of improving the system because they own everything? Dotsu Ajamuna says, mm -hmm. I would like how I like how we talk about things that should be done as if we don't know how the contra <laughs> contraption works. You expect the National Assembly to bite the hand that feeds them. Who honestly believes that a bunch of people unqualified to be representatives to begin with to embark on a process that will not favor them? Man, I laugh, but hope springs internal, I suppose. We have now come to the end of this week's episode of The Advocate. However, the advocacy continues on our social media platforms on Facebook, Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocate NG, or on Instagram at Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocate NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, go to plustvafrica.com forward slash The Advocate NG. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. Till next week, same time on this station. Let's keep advocating for a better society.